You are listening to Aim Higher, a Catholic podcast designed to instruct and to encourage the daily practice of our faith. Pax et bonum, peace and good to you all. This is Aim Higher. I'm Father Anthony, and I'm here with Sister Catherine, and also with his why is it funny? Why, why are you laughing? I'm about to do an introduction, a very important and serious introduction. It's probably the biggest introduction, sister, of, of my career as a podcaster. And you laughed. I'm sorry. I, you I laughed. Really... <sighs> will, will, will you forgive me? Because I did not know what I did. Oh, that was good. That was good. Of course I forgive you, sister. I have <laughs> His Excellency, Most Reverend Giles Butler, OFM. What I, I I'm so used to saying like, "Hello, Your Excellency," "Hello, Sister," but that I see you, it just feels weird to say hello like when we're on the radio. But hello, <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> okay, let, we're gonna go through the small talk portion of of, of today's episode. How are you? How is the weather today? Your Excellency. It's very windy today. It was, <laughs> my flight was canceled, so I am here today. Very so good. I, uh, yeah. So I convinced him. He's like, you know, it would be great use of your, your day. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. You, you know what's very interesting, though? When you <laughs> called me up and said, Bishop Giles would like to be on the program today, you made it sound like he's like, you know what? Since I don't got to fly... I'll be on, I'll do the episode with you because I'm really interested in the topic you're going to do, which is going to be on the seven last words. I, kind of very interesting to begin in such a humorous way and such a very serious topic, but uh, being that it's the Lenten season, we're coming into Passion Week, but this would be an excellent time to talk about the not just the words themselves, but the meaning behind the words, the circumstances of why our Lord said it, and how it affects us. And part of the, how do I say, our, our exa the, his example that we are meant to follow and what we can learn from it. <clears throat> and we were, I, I do not have the copy of the book right in front of me, sister. <laughs> And there was a book that prompted you to suggest this topic. Uh, I have uh, it. <laughs> it's Seven Last Words of by Christ, Father. Uh, of Christ on the Cross by, Father, by Father Christopher Ringers. Ringers, OFM, Capuchin. OFM, Capuchin. You see, I remembered the last name, <laughs> but I didn't remember the book. But I've read the book before. I read it a few years ago. Father Joseph actually... He does snippets of this book during his Good Friday program. And that doesn't end up on the I hit well, something. I hit something on the computer and I don't know if that's gonna end up on the Well all that means is you <laughs> love the Catholic Faith radio program. There you go. That's all that means. It's, it's just that there was like this notification. It was driving me nuts. So I was trying to get rid of it. Well, I pray, you know what? I looked up here earlier. I said notifications. It's like, oh, I got a notification. I press it. No notifications. <laughs> so my notification was to tell me I have notifications. <laughs> it was telling me nobody likes you. Okay. <laughs> well, I hope that that if people saw it means that you know that you're loved. You're, you're By love. someone, maybe me. I'm not sure. Probably. Why not? But the bishop loves you. I'll just put the, put put him in the hot seat right now. <laughs> He's got really quiet. <laughs> 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 but 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 okay. But start. You got this book, mm -hmm. and you said you're doing it for your 
book, book club? club. Or, mm -hmm. You're doing yep. it right now for the book club. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. I, I didn't know if it was a book you're going to do or not. Nope. Nope. We well, started it. We'll be finishing it next week. Oh, okay. I'm about to say, how far did you get into it? When did you start it? Uh, well, we did the first. Where's my cheat? It's, I don't need my cheat. I, um, I had it marked. We did the first three mm. words. Um, and then we're going to finish the rest of the book for next week. So. Well, it's it's not a big it, a big book. No. It's like 88 pages or something. Yes. Uh, 80, 83 or so. Um, okay. But I really enjoyed it. I mean, or I should say I'm enjoying yeah. it so far. I didn't yeah. get as far as I wanted to before we started this episode, but today has been a little interesting. Well, so. it's been a very interesting week uh, for me, but I guess I read the book before, so I'm familiar with the book, and I've, and I've often quoted from this book in sermons on this topic, so... Hopefully, I don't I don't draw a blank when we get into into the words. So, any any uh, beginning thoughts uh, from you, Your Excellency, on before before we get into the seven last words? Oh well, I am not really familiar with the book. I can't claim that I have read it, uh, but I am familiar with the seven last words. And I told Sister I might not know them in order. I says I get them out of order, but. There are things that come up in my sermons quite frequently, um, especially on Friday. I think of um, in the office of Prime, Deus meos, Deus meos, quare me de reliquisti me. My, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I don't know why, but you know, even for my seminary days, that just the beginning of that psalm on uh, Prime does something you can't help but look at the crucifix and think of our lord hanging there on the cross and i even recall as a seminarian going to bishop lewis how can this be he cannot be forsaken by himself um, this is god and bishop lewis would give me no direct answer he said you'll just that's something you're going to have to figure out for yourself um, i did quite a bit of research looking in uh, the fathers of the church looking for an explanation <clears throat> and while there are explanations out there none of them actually ever really sounded satisfying to me um, and yes christ in his human nature felt that abandonment he willingly embraced that feeling of abandonment um, because of our human nature and he wanted to suffer that with us uh, but like so many things it is a mystery um, that we can come up with explanations, but to really understand it, I think it requires God to turn on a light bulb and open up that thought to us. Um, but it comes up, I think, frequently in my sermons, that idea, and then also um, forgiving those, um, lay not this charge against them. Um, I like to quote our Lord hanging there on the cross, St. Stephen as he's being stoned, um, these words, um, and of course I use our Lord's sacrifice quite frequently because the sacrifice on the cross is one and the same with the sacrifice of the mass. Um, <clears throat> our Lord invites us, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and come follow me. Um, and that is really the invitation to be his disciple. And without uh, doing this, we're not really his disciple at all. Um, so contrary to the, what the world is constantly telling us, that we don't have to do anything, that Christ has done everything for us, um, I think Christ has made a very good argument throughout the Gospels that there are things he expects us to do. Um, it's not a, that he's done it all. His sacrifice is infinite. Um, and if great value and there's nothing we can add to it and then i ask well why does saint paul says that we must uh complete what is lacking in christ's sacrifice um what is lacking in christ's sacrifice is our cooperation our use of um these graces that he's married for us so it's as the protestants argue christ has saved us it's done um, and the catholic responds christ has redeemed us without our effort but he will not save us without doing our part. And I don't want to take up all your time. I think Sister has something planned here. Uh, 
well, I get on the radio with Father Joseph and I just go, you okay, just, Father, there's my 30-minute <laughs> sermon. Yeah. We got to the bottom of the hour. We got to the top of the hour. Just I've got four of those prepared. And you, you went through all the questions in the first 30 minutes. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's happened a lot of times there uh, on the program. But, well, that, that last quote there was St. Augustine. I know God, our Lord, redeemed us with our help would not save us without our help, without our assistance. And I've explained that to Protestants and even to Catholics who want to have a deeper understanding. God, as our creator, he respects his creation. He's given us the tools to cooperate with his grace. He's not going to um, undermine that. He wants to save the entirety of man. And since man has a free will, it makes sense that it requires man's cooperation to work out his salvation. That's how I've always looked at it, um, especially when you read like St. Augustine, uh, Saint, uh, any of the fathers of the church, really, uh, but especially the more recent ones like St. Francis de Sales, St. Alfonso de Liguori touching on this matter we man um is is meant to adore god with his entire the entirety of his being not just part of it and faith being the the beginning of justification is not justification in itself but this is not meant to be an apologetic uh <laughs> well, so but i was thinking this Lent, uh, in my Lenten meditations, the idea of sacrifice has been a, a central theme, I guess, if you will. Uh, but I'm looking back to the Garden of Paradise, and I conclude that sacrifice was essential even before the fall. Um, and if I look at the Garden of Paradise, Adam was given the command, all these trees you can eat the fruit of, mm -hmm. just this one. I'm asking you to sacrifice the pleasure of eating this, the fruit of this one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. I want that sacrifice from you. It's not a big one, but it is a sacrifice if I'm, mm -hmm. at least from my perspective of looking at it. And this was before the fall. So sacrifice is something that is inherent in us, that is necessary um, you know, for the proper worship of God. Um, and of course, that comes in with the... Uh, against the Novus Ordo changing the Mass into the celebration of the Last Supper, as opposed to the unbloody renewal of the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary. Well, the essence of, of sacrifice is love, and love is in the essence of sacrifice. And I, I remember not long ago, I was thinking about that, and if those two really go together, then... God creating us was in many ways a sacrifice because in creating an, an intelligent being has a free will, there was always the risk that, that they would go against him. Mm -hmm. So that was a sacrifice that God was willing to make yes. for his greater glory and for the sanctification of those that cooperate with his grace. Uh, it, it, it was quite a thought. And it, it's, it, could, it, it, it stems from the great, the great question that people ask. I say great uh, kind of uh, rhetorically, but they say, why did God create if he knew man was going to fall? And I just like explaining this as well. Up until the point God created, it was all hypothetical. He didn't know for sure that man was going to fall until he careful. created you better be careful there, Father. God knows everything. Well, <laughs> even it was, in the future. It was, <laughs> but but until He actually created, it was all hypothetical. It wasn't. It wasn't actually going to happen. But how I said it, you're right, Your Excellency. Yeah. It sounded like it could have been misinterpreted. As but God, God was ignorant of the future. Yeah, He was ignorant of all the possibilities. No, He knew all the possibilities, but it wasn't actually going to happen until it happened. I liked reading that in philosophy. That was nice. <laughs> but sure, I'm glad. Thank you, Your Excellency, because uh, I don't want to have to explain that one later. Actually, no, I would like to explain that one later. 
It might actually make people think. Um, anyway, so we, it's, seven I, last I, words. Sister, okay. did, did you want to lead us along? On this? I have the list, too. Well, okay, I'll, 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 I'll let you lead us along. Okay, so the first word, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can we believe that the Romans and the Jews did not know what they were doing? The Romans were executioners. They knew what they were doing. The Jews cried out, his blood be upon us and upon our children. They knew that Christ uh, performed these miracles, whether they believed it or not. They knew this is what he claimed. Um, I'm thinking they went in with their eyes wide open. What do you think, Father? Well, of course, I don't want to call Christ a liar either. I'm just, uh, I'm buying <laughs> the devil's advocate. Here. I would, well, of, of course, as, well, as you laid it out there, Your Excellency, the Romans, these were the executioners. They knew what they were doing. That was their job. You had the, you had the, when we mean the Jews, predominantly we're talking about the high priests, we're talking about the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And you go through the readings of fathers. I think it was Bernardine of Siena who talked about and say they knew exactly who Christ was. They, they, they knew he is God incarnate. So if they knew that and they said, do not know what they do, I would take that as, as, as meaning that they do not understand really what the... Uh, ramifications of their actions is going to be they don't understand uh what now is going to take place what's going to happen to their souls um and the, the magnitude of this action and that particular point is actually in this book because i know that's about this book it breaks down um it outlines each each well each chapter is each of the last words and then it breaks it down further but I think I'll just read here. This particular outline says, he excuses. Christ added words of excuse, for they know not what they do. No doubt these words applied most fully to the Roman soldiers, for they were just the rough instruments of execution. But the words were put forth as a plea for all, considering the blindness of human reason and the force of passion on the human will. The high priests and the other leaders knew quite well what they were doing, but even for them, the enormity of the crime may not have been altogether clear our lord prayed for their forgiveness oh, i thought that was I'm, when that comes up the idea comes up in my sermons quite frequently um, i encourage people to forgive their enemies to love their enemies to do good to those who persecute them and i use this quote really as the foundation of that argument uh, but i look at christ hanging there on the cross and he can forgive his enemy. Now, when I apply that to myself, uh, not that I am worthy to stand in the place of Christ, but I can forgive my enemy. And when I stop to analyze the harm that my enemy has done to me, um, by me being able to forgive um, and to go past to overlook this, um, I begin to see that my enemy has done more harm to himself than he has done to me. Um, and in that, I think they are ignorant. Um, everybody was, I think, aware of what they were doing to Christ. They were not aware of what they were doing to their own souls. Um, and I think Christ being God, he sees beyond his immediate pain, his immediate suffering, and he sees what is happening to the souls of these individuals in their hatred, in their eagerness to sin, they are damning their own souls and they cannot see that. They're not focused on that. Their hatred is outside of themselves, but they cannot see what's happening to their own souls. And so I think our Lord is praying for them. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing to themselves. And if we can enter into that spirit in the world today with those who would be our enemies, we see that those enemies are doing us the greatest good. The more they persecute me, the more I have the opportunity to practice virtue, to advance in holiness, and to become more like Christ. They are actually doing me a great service. But at the same time, they're my benefactor. 
they are doing the greatest harm to their own soul. And that is all really within my power uh, to make this turn into a good for me. Um, and I should be grateful for them. I should thank them for the good that they are actually doing to me, and I should pray for them. Father, forgive them. Well, it re reminds me of when uh, during the Sermon on the Mount, when our Lord brought up, the, before you bring your gift to the altar, go and be reconciled with thy brother. And try to blank on the exact quote, but our Lord does address the fact that your brother has anything against you, which I always thought was was very thought provoking because I, I don't only want to consider my own sin, how I have offended, or I might have taken part in whatever disagreement I have with my brother, but also that like he could be upset with me, he could be angry at me, and that could affect his own soul. So I should do my part to reconcile with him for his own good, as our Lord looked to make up for the sins of the world for our own good. The difference there is that our Lord had no sins of his own to make up for. He was per he was innocent. But we are called to imitate Christ as best as we can, and in this fact of forgiving, not just our friends, but more, our enemies especially. And that's one thing that Father Ringers brings up in that in, in the book in that chapter is the forgiveness of one's enemies. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. It's very clear. Our, our, if you, it's, our Lord explains, if you forgive your friends or you salute your friend, um, the pagans do that. You're no, no better than a pagan. But if you're going to follow my example, forgive those who persecute and calumniate you. And what are you hoping? that will happen, that you'll keep coals of fire upon their heads, meaning you're hoping that your goodwill towards them will affect them and bring about a conversion. But if we're not willing to put forth that effort to bring that about on our end, how can we expect for our brother? Well, and the book actually does cover the concept um, of praying the Our Father. It's like you really can't, and I, and I never thought about it this way until, a few, well, at least 10 years ago, I guess, having a conversation mm -hmm. with our older brother because I was in the middle of a disagreement between two Catholics. And one of them said to me, I, I'm not gonna, I can't forgive this person. I can't forgive this person. And I really did not know how to handle it. And I, um, as a, you know, a younger sibling goes to their older brother, um, he said, well, tell her then she shouldn't be praying the Our Father. I was like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well... <laughs> Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If you're not willing to forgive that person for that occurrence, don't expect, you know, how can you expect God to forgive you for what you've done against him? Mm -hmm. And it was just like, <laughs> of course, that's, that's brilliant. And I, I obviously that he did not come up with that as on his own. Um, although at the time I might've believed him if he told me, <laughs> um, that but that stayed really good. with me. That stayed with me because it is so true. But also, I remember reading not too long ago in our, I think it was our Franciscan meditation book, um, asking the question, are we really praying for those who have hurt us, our enemies? Do, I mean, someone that you really can't stand, are you praying for them? Do you want to see them in heaven? Because right now, when we've all have at some point in our life, someone that was like, you know, I would like to never see again. <laughs> Great. You know, I don't, I'll be happy if I don't have to see again. But do you mean that? In eternity too i mean <laughs> it, it, it is a, take the example of having masses said for somebody the people we think about are those who we're related to we're friends with um those who we are loved ones who have passed on uh, those we're hoping to see a conversion are any of those people you would consider um a possible enemy of yours or i would say they consider you an enemy but you mm -hmm. shouldn't consider them an enemy and, and i always thought it was a very interesting thing is that we're supposed to be uh all things to all men we're supposed to be like 
um, simple as doves around people. They're supposed to be forgiving. We're supposed to be, as our Lord told us, to have the humility of a child. I, if we're so, if we're supposed, we're we're the ones who are supposed to be putting that into action. So I, it re- it really shouldn't it really shouldn't be such a far fetched thought of put making our first prayers for those who we have who who there is an issue against. I we might not know a person in general, but those people who advocate abortion, for example, should be ones on the top of our list to pray for. And as I tell people, they say, well, Father, I mean, we don't see any conversions from these people. They haven't changed. So your prayers are not going to go into waste. They are going to help somebody. They will be available to help someone who's there to use them. They're not, God's just not going to shove them to the side. But we just have to keep on praying. We have to keep doing our part for, for the conversion of souls. It's, I've. I remember it was, um, I, I forget what they were, the person was talking about exactly. Uh, I think they were talking about someone who was a, a serial killer. I think, oh, I think it was Jeffrey Dahmer. Good, hell yeah, Jeffrey Dahmer. As per lady was going on about him and saying, as like, yep, as like, I'm glad, I hope he's burning in hell. Hope he's burning in hell. I said, I said, that's a horrible thing to say about anybody. So I don't care who they are. You, you shouldn't be saying about anybody. You should not want that for anybody. So why weren't you praying for the man? If it was such a serious matter to you, pray for their soul. Well, and I, I think we don't and shut often, them up at yeah. least. I, I don't think we often realize that if someone like Jeffrey Dahmer, if he did truly repent, God's still going to deal with him in his um in his judgment. There's still you know maybe he'll eventually get to heaven. I don't you know. Who well, knows? But it's just he's not off the hook per se. Well, I think if we consider God's will, God made Jeffrey Dahmer for the same reason he made the rest of us. It is God's will that we know, love and serve him in this world so that we can be happy with him in heaven. Mm-hmm. That is God's will. That is God's desire mm-hmm. uh, for us as well as Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> and <laughs> if we want, if we I love never God. Thought, I never thought I'd hear that statement on this uh podcast but if, anywhere. if we it's love true. god we have to love what god loves it's we true want what god wants and we and we've talked we talked about in book club recently that you know there are people that we're we know that are in heaven but there is no the church has not given absolute on anyone in hell so um well, we have to keep you have to keep praying. I mean, yes, you could look, you know, at all the things Jeffrey Dahmer's done. Terrible, absolutely terrible. Um, but he was, you know, given a soul and given a free will, just like the rest of us. You, know, you objectively look that he decided he did not want to know, love, and serve God. He wanted to serve himself. You know, yes, you could conclude things, but but again, we don't have the knowledge to actually make that judgment. We don't well, know. And of course, that apply. I mean, that's a really extreme case with Jeffrey Dahmer. I mean, you have different uh, psychological aspects, but just with anybody that you may have a grudge with, why this person? They may have done you a, an evil, and you're holding that against them for the rest of your life, and you're not getting over it. You are not um, forgiving them, which, if you pray the Our Father, then you're asking God not to forgive you. But that person may have made peace with God. They may have reformed their lives. Well, even if we take this to the ultimate extreme, God made the devils to be in heaven with him. Uh, We often picture, I think we get a false image of God gleefully rubbing his hands together as all these devils are cast into hell and are suffering. And I don't think that is a true image of God at all. I think God is greatly saddened by the fact that the devils have chosen uh, not to love him and have cast themselves into hell. Um, And I often come across, even in uh, religious books, the idea that God is going to uh, cast the evil into hell. And and I often tell people, I say, no, God's given you a free will. You choose not to love him. He says, I'm sorry that you don't love me, but and you don't want to be with me. So I will create a place specially for you uh, where you won't have to see me. You won't have to be with me. Um, and that place 
of your own choosing. <laughs> you have chosen to go there. So here it is. I love you enough. I will give you what you want. I, I just had a thought. It just crossed my mind. It, it's not the it's not theology, but oh, I almost thought for, just for a moment. It's, it's such a weird thought, Your Excellency, that you think of the pains of hell, and when the the final judgment, when the body and the soul, you know, are rejoined, and they both those in hell. They both will suffer, soul and body. One could almost see it as as almost a act of God's mercy that you have this other pain to do, to somewhat distract you from the pain of loss of God. It, that's just a thought that passed my mind. There's nothing theologically sound about it, but if, if I'm trying to to bring any point to it how serious and how all-consuming the loss of God is to the soul and why that is the greatest pain that the soul experiences. There all the other pains that we focus upon, the physical pains, the torments, like St. Alphonsus de Liguori explains in the, in the Torments of Hell in his book. None of them compare knowing that you will be eternally separated from God. I, it, and God, he created you to be with him. So you to be separated from him does not call, give him pleasure. He's not sadistic. He's got, God, you know, is not a Calvinist. And that's what Calvinists are. It's, it's a sadistic outlook, this predestination that God creates people to be damned. It, but anyway, it, it just, does it, that goes against the idea of our Lord asking for forgiveness, because if these men were among the damned, then why would he ask them to be forgiven? For they do not know what they do. They do not know what they are losing. They're not know, as you said, Your Excellency, what they're doing to their own souls. And now how many of them were blinded by that? And I, and I think back to St. Peter in the first sermon after Pentecost, when he called out the Jews for what they did. And they said, well, what can we do? Repent and be baptized. Those of you who will accept Jesus Christ and be baptized and become part of his church, you can be saved. But if you want to stay blind in your ignorance, our Lord, he allowed many of his followers to, to walk away when he revealed the dogma of the Eucharist. They were scandalized. That was a hard saying that you don't have to believe it. But St. Peter said it said, said 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 it true. Our Lord has spirit and life. So where else shall we go? And we see in our Lord here, what other example do we follow than to forgive those, forgive anyone who has harmed us, who has done us any evil? You know, we don't have to forget what they've done because we stay wise, but forgive them. Desire the good for them. Desire them to be converted. If you don't want, if you don't want everyone to go to hell, I mean, excuse me, if you don't want everyone to go to heaven, then you're not imitating Christ well, at all in your life. You're not going to get there either. <laughs> you're not going to get there either. No. Uh, well, I think... If you, if you don't mind, Father, there's just this little small paragraph at the end of the chapter that I think would just wrap this particular point up, if, unless we have anything more we want to say about this first of the last words. No, because if we keep it going, I could, we <laughs> could, we could spend it's going to be a seven-hour episode. The whole episode on this. This will be a seven-part. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anytime that we feel resentment and the growing of hard feelings and grudges within us, let us remember these things. Above all, let us look back to Calvary and remember the words of our Lord. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Okay. And it's such a relief to the soul. If you can, if you can honestly examine yourself and say, I'm an enemy to no man, as far as in my power. It's a relief to know that 
you do not hate anybody. <laughs> All right. Okay. Moving on. Second, second, yes. The second word. Amen, I say to thee, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Oh, we have the words addressed to the good thief, the repentant criminal. Um, and as Sister pointed out, was it this past week? That's a very tempting thought for so many Catholics that I can be converted and saved at the last hour. So I can really sin on bravely, and then right before I die, tell God I'm sorry, um, and that's it. And I pointed out to Sister when she mentioned that, well, that good thief still died on the cross. He accepted that death, that punishment for his crimes um, as being just. He was resigned, this is just and this is good. I deserve to be here, but obviously God does not deserve to be here. Um, and then it wasn't as if he got away scot-free. Um, he, he suffered that death on the cross, um, and um, God accepted that. If we just do a little bit, um, God magnifies that and makes it worth a while. Um, just like at the... At the Mass, we bring our offering to God, and our offering is of no value. It is worthless, but when it is united with Christ, sacrifice with Christ, offering to his Father in heaven, that little sacrifice becomes infinitely worthwhile. Um, and there, therein, we have value. Um, I like to point out around Mother's Day that, you know, the little boy goes out and picks a bouquet of dandelions and brings them in to his mother, they are the most precious flowers. They are the most beautiful things. She will get a little vase and put them in, and she will be most grateful for them. I said, but if her husband did the same thing, he would get thrown back in his face. <laughs> I said, we are like little children to God, and our offerings are like dandelions, but they are precious to God because he is judging the attitude, the sentiment that went forth, that came forth from us in giving this and making this offering. And so that intention, uh, that act of our will is most important. Yeah, I think because we were talking it, more of a, that was like a point of envy some people have of that, that 11th hour concept, you know, thinking, well, wouldn't it be great, you know, the people that have cancer and they're given six months to die, isn't it great to know that you only have six months to live? Um, wouldn't that be a blessing? But it's like, but they were just saying, well, now I'll start loving you, God. And we all know. A well, no, we'll, we'll sit on bravely for five months. Five months, right? <laughs> and, then, and then. um, The last month we'll repent. Which it's just, who wants to be loved like that on earth? You know. Well, that is not love. Right, right. But I mean, if you don't want that, why would you think God should, why should you think that's good enough to give to God? But. I read somewhere online and we didn't really unpack it too much because I was kind of saving it for, for you, Father. Um, uh, someone was posing the question as a argument they get from a pro from Protestants is that the example of the good, fee good thief is, um, wouldn't that be the, the absolute um, prime example of how it's faith alone and not works? Because what did, what did the good thief do? And of course, the bishop said, well, he did a lot in just that short example. But have you ever had anybody give you that as an argument? No, I've never heard. I've never heard that as an argument for faith alone. But it's not just faith alone. Right, but they're I mean, saying that the good thief didn't do anything to get heaven. That that's a, that was the example of that's what God God condone or uh. Well, I, I, I would say he did a lot there because this is only we're only on the second word of our Lord and he was going to be hanging there for quite a bit long time. Got his legs broken, uh, had to suffocate and die. We don't even know exactly what happened to his body. Um, I'd say he suffered quite a bit. Right. So basically, you know, you look at he his also, conversion probably came pretty early um, and then. He probably from that point on 
offered well, you look, all that you up. Look, you look at some of the accounts, uh, the different accounts of, of the Gospels, you know, originally you see that he joined in in the mockery of our Lord. And it was that moment of grace. And it's not this presumptuous faith that they, that they think they think that this is. It is an act of faith, but it's also an act of charity and hope. The theological virtues are at work in the good thief. And his act of love, the sacrifice of himself, is, is what he is showing our Lord, which is why our Lord accepted you know, his repentance. And what did the good thief? He, he, didn't, he didn't say... Uh, take me with you into your kingdom. Just remember me. Don't forget me. And this day you'll be with me in paradise. And that 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 is not a invitation for us to hope we are the eleventh hour convert or to envy those. It's for us every day to realize that. We too could, are meant to have that love for God, you know, and it's meant to grow each and every day. So the intensity of the love that the good thief had, did it match the intensity of a St. Francis of Assisi, one that took years and years to develop? No. Shouldn't we want to have a greater love for God? Not not to be that, that, that la- as you said, get that last spot in purgatory mentality are we have, we have to say, thank you, Lord, for giving me the opportunity to, to have every day to love you. I, I, that, so it, it's, it's like, don't make excuses. It's basically what I say to people. Says, no, no, no. God is just show is showing us how his mercy is even to the, who see the most, uh, dejected people he is there for them he will even help them but you're not them and another argument i might suggest that we should live every moment as if it is our last moment yes every hour as if it's our last hour every day if it's as if it were going to be our last because we really don't know and our lord in many parables tells us we must watch and pray we must constantly be vigilant for we do not know the hour we do not know when we will be called upon to give an account of our soul. Um, and so we must prove ourselves to be the good and faithful servant who is watching, who is using his talents wisely and is prepared when the master calls upon him and the master can call at any time. And so truly, if we're going to learn anything from the good thief is that we must always live as if this were our last hour. And really, we should end our day with actually maybe saying that ourselves. Lord, remember me. <laughs> Please remember me. When you come, come to your kingdom. kingdom. Yep. I mean, I, that just occurred to me now, but I think when that that's... When you come probably. to judge the living and the dead, remember me. What, when I come in my last hour, when, I, when, when I'm before you in my particular judgment, remember me. And I think uh, if we are faithful to our prayers, we, we are in essence saying that. We are, that is what we're saying you know, acknowledging that. And that's why I like those short prayers. So. Yeah. Any, anything else? I, 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 I have, I have really no, nothing else to say uh, on that part. It, it's, um, that's pretty much all you need to say on that one. It just shows how it's never too late for a person to, to return to God. Yeah. So, right, how many and, people probably looked at that thief as, you know, the lowest of the low and probably everybody else gave up any hope of, I mean, he's, he's obviously not going to live very long and, you know, who knows what people really thought happens after that when they die. But, uh, and, and then you, there you see the love of our Lord again, because he himself was be considered the lowest of low being crucified with the thief. Yeah. Um, but what's, what is nice about this book, um, and I'll make sure I make a mention it in our, um, in the links below of where they can find this book. Cause I think it does 
outlined it very, the words very well, um, very mm -hmm. simply. Um, so, and if, I feel like if I can get something from it, anybody can get something from it. So, um, very powerful. Um, cause sometimes you see books, uh, on this particular topic and they can be overwhelming. And this is, this, this sum things up pretty well. Um, so, so on to the third word. On to the third word. Okay. When Jesus, therefore, had seen his mother and the disciple standing whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. After that, he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. So when I, when I, when I get to this one, my mind for, goes to the argument that people make, well, they want to say that Mary had more children. Our Lord had brothers and sisters. And it makes, and when you hear this, I just remember the argument given saying, look, if our Lord had other siblings, other brothers, as you claim that he did, then why did he leave his mother in the care of St. John, who was not his brother? And it would have been an insult to his brothers. <laughs> Um, so it, it's one of, one of the more, uh, I could say practical arguments, but, uh, one of the simpler arguments, uh, for the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. But I, I but I don't think that's the major point here is that the Blessed Mother is being given to the care of St. John and St. John into her care as well. And, St. John takes the place of all of us. That we are given this mother, this advocate to go to, this this perfect vessel of grace to have a, as our mother. And that that's all I can say at this point. Um, I'm just. <laughs> well, this is. I believe this is the gospel from First Saturday. Um, first Saturdays was at the Immaculate Heart of Mary that we read mm -hmm. this in the yes. gospel. Um, and, and the gospel continues that St. John took her into his home and uh, lived the rest of her life there with St. John. Um, and obviously in the gospel of St. John, where we read more about, I guess, the infancy, the life of Christ, that had to have been revealed to him by the Blessed Mother because St. John joined our Lord as an apostle or disciple um, when Christ was an adult. Um, do, so we see the, oh, yes, Father? Do you mean St. Luke? Oh, St. Luke. Saint, okay, well, St. Saint, Saint Luke, uh, yeah, maybe it is St. Luke. It's, but, yeah, but it is the Blessed Mother who revealed these things. Mm -hmm. um, and St. John was the beloved disciple. He was the one who laid his head on our Lord's breast. He was the one faithful enough to stand beneath the cross with uh, Christ there, um, the Blessed Mother. Um, so he is there in place of the church. Uh, the church has received the Blessed Mother. The Blessed Mother has been given the church. And so she is um, our guide, our director. Um, I was thinking about the rosary, uh, planning for writing for the month of May um, in the seraph, but the, what is the rosary but meditating upon the life of Christ? You know, it is a devotion to the Blessed Mother, but it is the life of Christ that we're looking at. Um, the meditations are the life of Christ, and I'd like to consider that we are meditating the life of Christ as seen through the eyes of Mary. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, she is recalling to us the life of Christ, or we are listening to her, uh, recount these events in the life of Christ. And I think it is would be a wonderful meditation while we're going through the rosary and the mysteries to think of this. Uh, the Blessed Mother is here and she is, you know, opening the book, uh, the photo album, if you will, and pointing out to us these events in the life of Christ, of her beloved son, and that we are to follow along. Um, and we enter into these sentiments of Christ, but these were sentiments that the Blessed Mother had with Christ. Um, so we experience her joys. We ex 
experience her sorrows. We experience her glories. Uh, but these were, she received them from Christ. Um, so it was Christ is the origin of these things. Um, so as the great proponent of the Blessed Mother, or devotion to the Blessed Mother would tell us, it is to Christ through Mary. Um, and so I see in this our Lord uh, giving St. John to his mother, his mother to St. John, he has given her to us. Um, and as he, as we receive her, that is how we receive Christ. And so I really have uh, pity, if you will, for so many Protestants who want to decry devotion to the Blessed Mother. Uh, we don't need the Blessed Mother. We can go to God ourselves. I says, yes, you can. Uh, but he's not going to be pleased with your uh, dismissing his Blessed Mother. Um, and he loves his mother. Um, and she has been given that power, that place in the church to lead us to him or to guide us in our path to him. Well, and the devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary was, it's, has its origin right from the apostles. It was right in the early church. You 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 saw that in the writings of the fathers, and you know in the, about the fourth cent that would be the uh, fifth century of the Council of Ephesus, uh, defining her role as Mother of God, not just Mother of Jesus as our Lord's humanity, but the his his Mother. If He is both God and man, then she is the Mother of God. It's it's more of like an ergo sort of situation. But one of the things that often brought up is that they'll quote scripture and they say well it says saint paul says there's only one mediator between god and man that's jesus christ i said that is true totally true yes but it doesn't say there's there can't be a mediator between us and christ mm -hmm. and it's the old story it's the it's old story being told when i was a child it's like if you have a if you had to ask your father something and you're nervous to do it, who's the person you talk to to kind of butter them up a little bit? You talk to your mother. <laughs> you go to her. <laughs> and I says that, 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 that there's some truth to that. I never experienced that in my childhood, but <laughs> I think others have. Yeah. Maybe I, we should just flip this for you. Maybe when you wanted something from your mother, did you go to your father to butter her up? I, 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 no, yeah. I, I, that's, yeah. that's kind of how we did. I had to do that, um, you know, or I'd make sure one of her friends called her, put her in a good mood, uh, you know, something like that. <laughs> but it, it, it's, there's nothing saying that you can't go to the Blessed Mother for aid. In fact, we are encouraged to do that. And so many, I, I only can imagine the wonderful lessons that St. John learned being with the Blessed Mother for as long as he was. And since he ended up in Ephesus, conclude the Blessed Mother probably went with him to Ephesus. And um, the example she was in the early church, I know there are books written about that, and I don't know how much of it is devotional or historically accurate, but the Blessed Mother remained in that very simple and quiet life, that role. It wasn't until she assumed into heaven that she started to you know, um, have that greater impact upon the church as really as the mediator being sent by God in the various apparitions um, all throughout history, Remi especially uh, in Fatima, reminding us to pray the rosary and how important suffering and sacrifice imitation of our lord on the cross is and then we go to that aspect here our lord does this you know he's basically tying up all of his loose ends his final loose end on this earth was his was his mother making sure she was taken care of but we're also reminded of what she was going through during our lord's passion and death it, it it's it, I just think of what St. Bernardine of Siena said, that if we, ex no, it was um, Bernard of Clairvaux, if we experienced 
the pain that she did during our Lord's Passion, we would have died because it was that intense. But the graces that the Blessed Mother had, or I should say has, because of her prerogative of being the Mother of God, this singular vocation, she she was given the graces to endure. And she is calling us. I love in the Stations of the Cross when they when they tell us to to join Mary, let her be your guide, uh, come along with her on this on the on the Via Dolorosa, share in her sorrow, learn from her sorrow, uh, in the imitation of Christ and His suffering. I, it, it's a and it's a very powerful image. You have like the Pieta, our Blessed Mother, holding her holding our Lord in her arms. It's these are the things that really can help draw the compunction of heart in the soul, especially during this season of Lent. And we get that you know, through the Blessed Mother. And it's just, it, it is a shame. It is a shame that there are many out there, more, more than not, who do not understand the wonderful role that the Blessed Mother is meant to have in everyone's life. And... That's all I'll say on that because I have nothing else to say uh. unless I keep riffing. <laughs> we could continue, but I think we want to get uh, through some of these other words. There's, uh, there's could, four more. Yes. We, we could never stop talking about the Blessed Mother. There is so much there. Um, so no, just, we have to, what is that, put a pin in it? Is that what we're talking I, I about? I guess, or? but then uh, I, a pin would be would imply that eventually it'll come out. And so is there going to be like a part two? Well, maybe next year we'll just. <laughs> well, plus the mother's always going to get mentioned. Oh, sure. Yes. Sure. Um, I guess with all that I'll, my part in this, cause I figured I was going to be the simpleton in this conversation, you know, but um, just makes me think of what we learned as children um, all to Jesus through Mary. And I, I just love that. Um, so that, you know, we ended that, I think, I think it was our grandparents that said that, after, especially after the meal prayer, you know, made mm-hmm. the sign of the cross and all to Jesus through Mary. And it's just, mm-hmm. it's so beautiful. I put that on my uh, holy card for my profession. Um, mm-hmm. So it just, it's, it's perfect. So. You, you can't get better than St. Louis de Montfort. All right. So the fourth word, and hopefully I won't botch this. So, <laughs> and And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Sounded just fine. I was nervous, so, (laughs) especially with him sitting here right by me. Mm -hmm. You did wonderful, sister. (laughs) Sounded great. All to Jesus through Mary. Yes, there you go. It sounded really nice to me. It's really nice to me. No, well, I mentioned that quote, I think, right there. To In the beginning, beginning yes. That <laughs> is um, one of my, I don't know, I wouldn't say favorites, but it is like soul touching, something that really uh, reaches deep when we stop and think about it. And I think too often we just live on the surface of these words. Um, you really need to spend some time just quietly reflecting on these words in the I don't know, the silence of your soul, um, away from everything to really appreciate, I I would say the same of all of these last words, but um, this one here, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It is just filled with such mystery, um, at least for me. Um, we know that Christ is God. The Father didn't forsake him. Um, he cannot forsake himself. He has not abandoned Uh, from himself. There is not a separation of his divinity and his humanity uh, because the divinity and the humanity are inseparable from the hypostatic union, um, which may be a little bit too uh, much theology, but... No, it's perfectly good for me, Your Excellency. (laughs) They are one and the same, but yet Christ chooses to feel this abandonment to experience this uh, spiritual abandonment by God. And I think too often 
in our own lives, we look at the problems and the difficulties. Where is God? Why did God allow this to happen? What did I do to deserve this? And my reflection on that is we need to conform ourselves to God's will rather than to try and conform God to our will. And of course, those who listen to my sermons know I quote Job of the Old Testament, the look. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It, it should all be okay with us. And after that, I come to the New Testament and look at the Blessed Mother at the Annunciation, her fiat. Here I am, Lord. I'm your handmaid. Do with me whatever you will. I'm yours. Uh, you will find no resistance in me. I put my will in yours. Whatever you want, that is what I want. Um, that is what I desire and I want nothing more. Um, and so we look at Christ in his abandonment and there is really an, a wealth of possibilities for us to consider um, pious sentiments that can fill our hearts. I know for at least a few hours, if not for days, if we were to really delve into it, uh, but our Lord chose to suffer that. That was a suffering that he willingly embraced above and beyond the physical torment, above and beyond uh, the suffering for our souls and the no knowledge that his suffering would be in vain for many, uh, that many would not benefit. Um, this was, you might say, a torture above and beyond all of that. Um, that he chose to feel this abandonment. So it is not like Christ doesn't know what we feel. He doesn't know. He chose to experience that for the love of us. He chose to experience that to show us that there is a way through it. And I think it, it really began in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, when he prayed, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, thine be done. And I think, well, I not only think, but I encourage people in your prayers to make that your own. Okay, God, I want this or that. I've got this special need, but not my will, thine be done. And I often encourage people, they ask me, pray that this cross be lifted from me, that I overcome this problem or that problem, uh, that God will help me pray for this intention. I said, yes, we can pray for that, but also pray that if it's God's will, that you have this cross, just pray for the grace to carry the cross. God, if it's not possible to take this cross away from me, just give me the grace to carry the cross as you did in Calvary, um, despite all the obstacles, despite all the pain, all the feeling of abandonment. Um, and I think many of us have probably felt that abandonment in times of temptation, if, we, if we've taken our faith seriously, the devils are constantly after us. We're constantly under assault um, from the world, our fallen nature and the devils, this constant assault and in many dark times, it seems, where is God? Where is the light? Um, and Christ has experienced this for us to say, okay, I've been there. I know that, I understand it, I've experienced it. Um, this is what you need to do, still trust in God. Um, and I see in that really the idea that, Lord, if you can, if it's not possible to take this cross from me, um, then please just give me the grace to carry it as Christ did, as the Blessed Mother did. Um, help me to learn from the example of all the saints truly. Well, when I when I think of this, these words of our Lord, I ask the question to myself, my God, my God, why have I forsaken you? When I give into my own will, when I fall into sin, even a venial sin, why am I forsaking you? You have given me all things, you've given, my, given me my very life. And in here now, and I, 
I meditate on your passion. You've given me your own life as a sacrifice so I may be saved. I may go to heaven. And I, I don't, I'm going to risk here. I'm, I'm going to bring the fifth word into this because I think that, I think these two go together. Our Lord says after that, he says, I thirst. So even after he feels the, the despair, he still thirsts for souls. The same way, even though we go through hard and difficult times, we still have the thirst for our salvation. We still have the thirst for, to achieve that level of holiness that God has destined for us. Because in that, we are uniting our will with his, said in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. Now, if our will is united with God's, it goes without saying. And we will have that thirst. We will never tire to keep striving for that perfection, to always wanting to do more for God. I had a class today uh, for a third order and preparing somebody for their investiture. And we were talking about visits to the Blessed Sacrament. And and as I mentioned to him, said we can, you could have someone say, I go to Mass, I visit our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. I see him when I go to church on Sunday. I said, but that is not what our Lord is asking you to do. You are bound by the law of God and church law to go to Mass on Sunday. So that's like you've got a court order and you're visiting our Lord. He's asking you to do that when you are not required to have to do that, to come to him, to want to be by him. And of course, as the man listened to this, he thought about it. He says, yeah. He said, it makes you think that I could always be doing more. So we always have to be wanting to do more. We can never settle for just good enough. You know, we get, we, what, what, I, what is that you've said before, Excellency? God doesn't want slop. <laughs> yes, you, I, I remember writing that down years ago. I had it on a post-it note right God, above my office desk. God so. doesn't want slop. He, do, he doesn't want us to say that's good enough. We always have to strive for more. I, and I, I, I know, I know, I know. You can get the the individuals who are very have a very sensitive conscience, who fall into scrupulosity. That's I'm talking about the general. We always have to be striving. You know, it's just there's a difference between seeing sin everywhere and seeing opportunities to love God more and more. There's always an opportunity. And that's why I feel these two words go together. It's the two and two different sides of the coin. We have those times where it's very difficult. We feel like God, you know, where are you? He says, I'm right here. Do you desire my help? Do you thirst for my help? Do you want it? You only need to ask, and I will give you the grace to bear this cross. I will make it sweet and light. So we're thirsting for something that is sweet and light, and it comes only from Christ. It makes me think, I don't think it was a Catholic prayer, but um, a, a poem about footprints in the sand. Yes. Uh, and where the individual is complaining, I see in the sand during the good times when I was, you were, the footprints show that God was walking there beside me. But in my darkest hour, I only see one set of footprints, Lord. What happened there? Why did you leave me in that darkest hour? And the response is that I didn't leave you. That's where I carried you. Um, and I think too often we feel that abandonment when Christ is closest to us. Um, mm. And God allows us to feel that. Uh, because it is a means to draw us closer to him, um, not just him physically coming near to us, but now us spiritually coming nearer or closer to him. And, you know, in the matter of uh, penance and confession, we examine our conscience and uh, we end up committing the same sins over and over again. We say, Lord, you know, what is wrong with me? And the devil is there to tempt us to despair. And frequently confessors mm -hmm. say, look at our Lord on the way to Calvary. Every time he fell, he got up. Um, I just need you at this moment to resolve. I want to get up. I want to try. Um, I want to continue. 
you need to have that thirst. And I often encourage penitents, I say, God isn't really interested in what we can accomplish. God is interested in what we want to accomplish, what we desire to accomplish. He's interested in us fighting the good fight, um, not resigning, not giving up. You fall, no big deal. Get up. It's a big deal if you stay down. Mm -hmm. As soon as you fall, get up. Don't stay down. Um, Repent. Tell God you're sorry and thirst for that love of Christ. Thirst, desire uh, that union with God. And you, God hasn't abandoned you in your sin. You have abandoned God in the sin. Um, what God is most pleased with is that no matter how far you've fallen, how deep you've fallen, you're still clawing away, trying to get up. And that desire, that uh, burning desire, that will to continue on despite whatever, that is what is pleasing to God. And I often refer to it, I guess, because of my German ancestry, is that German stubbornness. You know, <laughs> um, I will do this or I will die trying. Um, it doesn't matter what gets in my way. This is my goal and nothing else matters. I'm going to reach this goal. And if we can develop that attitude in serving God in our spiritual life, it doesn't matter what temptations assail us. It doesn't matter that we've fallen into grievous sin. What is important is that we rise from the grievous sin, that we fight against the temptation, that we struggle, that we have this singleness of mind and purpose that I want to be with God. Um, And even when it seems that God has abandoned us, It should only excite even more our desire to find him, to cry out with Christ on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or why have I forsaken you? Uh, Come. Uh, But of course, so often we're doing it for selfish reasons because we want to feel that peace that we want, that we've lost. We want to feel that joy that is gone. Um, And this (laughs) is really God's way of, Uh, waking us up but if we can rise above that um, I if I can pull St. Paul into this where he says I am willing to be anathema for those whom I love I'm willing to go to hell so that those whom I love shall be saved that they shall be converted and I know on first blush this is inconceivable it's illogical uh, but it requires a little deeper thought, a little deeper consideration. Wow. Uh, <laughs> wow, I was gonna say, of course, Saint Paul knows that because he has just the intensity of his desire, he knows that's not gonna send him to hell. Um, that would only just up solidify his place in heaven. So he knows what he's saying. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because his love is so great for his fellow man that he is going to be spared. This. It, re- it reminds me of, from the revelations of, of Margaret of Cortona, where she would say to our Lord, "Is like, just let me love you now. Even if I go to hell, I just want to be united with you. As I don't even care what happens. Even if that's where I'm destined to go, I want to love you right now. Someone said, well, that's a horrible thing to say, but you have to re- understand the intensity of a love she had for our Lord, knowing that that would not be her fate. But it's just how serious she was. And you know, your Excellency, you were touching upon, I, I, I should have known you had started on it, but it, I was thinking about it because the, the constancy we have to have in the practicing of our faith, in our prayers, in studying our faith, in our good works, because we will have the, the time of the, of the spiritual aridity, that dryness. And and that's where you see display here with our Lord on the cross. And anyone who has um, experienced it knows that feeling. Here is our Lord on the cross doing doing his work for our redemption. And, and he's displaying a, a soul 
that is receiving no consolation, but also telling us we must continue and that I thirst, I still want to do God's will. And even though we're not going to get anything right in right now, the immediate satisfaction, we know it is what God is requiring us to do at this time. And this is what we will do. And this is what we have to keep striving for. As I remember St. Uh, Teresa of Avila went, said that she went 30 years without any consolation in her prayers, in her good works. 30 years. Uh, it, then there's no surprise to me why she's called saint. <laughs> because she continued doing what, she, what was, was required of her as her vocation of being a Carmelite. She did not falter from that, and she knew it, not my will, but God's will. I wouldn't be surprised when she wrote the, um, I slip my interior castle, Yeah, that she true. was that she was going through it that time. It wouldn't surprise me. I don't know it for sure, but that wouldn't surprise me. Knowing what the soul has to go through in order to get closer and closer to God. And here we have our Lord. And just these simple words giving us this example and this encouragement to keep on going, even during the hard times, just keep working out salvation, desiring to follow his example. And knowing that he he did it first and he's going to be there for us all the time, that is gr the greatest encouragement we can have through all the troubles in this pilgrimage in this valley of sorrows we have to go through uh, you mentioned uh the aridity and prayer and this is another thing that comes up from penitence quite frequently i pray the rosary but i get nothing out of it um i go to mass but i get nothing out of it um you know it doesn't do anything for me and it's and of course the response is pretty obvious do you pray for yourself or for or for the love of God? Um, mm -hmm. Are you only going to pray to God? Are you only going to love God when you feel good? Um, we it's easy to, to do. We need to persevere <laughs> through this prayer, even when you get nothing out of it, because actually when you think you're getting nothing, that is when you are, your willingness to persevere in spite of not getting any candy, uh, I'm going to still do my job even though i don't get the pat on the back i don't get the candy um i don't get the raise or the bonus or the accolades that uh, i think i deserve i'm still going to do my job to the best of my ability um despite not getting acknowledgement or praise the pat on the back is this our attitude um and in the world we encourage children uh we encourage employees in the workplace with that pat on the back uh we'll give you a 50 cent plaque that says sure the employee of the month isn't this great um i'll and, take the 50 cents to keep the plaque. <laughs> but when it comes to the spiritual life um that's as the extent of our love um and it is selfish and our Lord is trying to lead us from that self-centeredness and to the complete abandonment to him, uh, that complete love of him, uh, so that I will continue my prayers, whether I get any consolation or not. I will continue my meditation, uh, whether I feel God's presence there or not. And I, as I mentioned before, God is more pleased with those struggles Yes. And with the accomplishment of reaching our goal, um, the goal is always kept just out of reach. Heaven won't be ours until we leave this world. Well, it, it reminds me of what St. Anthony of the Desert said on that topic. He said, do you find it difficult to pray? I will give you the remedy. Pray. Mm -hmm. Says that's what you have to do. You have to keep on doing it. Keep on struggling. I've had. But a few people come to me on that and says, you have to keep on praying. He says, even is it father, I could not focus on the rosary. I, I, no matter what I did, my mind kept wandering. So I just gave up. I couldn't think about it. 
I said, but that's when you should have continued. You might not be aware of the graces you are receiving because they're not as obvious, because they're not um, connected also with your emotion. And very often that's our, when we receive consolation, it's just everything's clear, everything's coming to us. And and we just feel this this uh, welling, uh, welling up within us, this affection for God. I, I've told people the story, and it's it's still true. I said I remember this one time in the during my novitiate, and they're praying the rosary by myself, and it was the most delightful experience I've ever had in prayer. And I remember at the end saying, if every time I pray the rosary like it was like this, I'd have no problem praying the rosary. Well, I don't know if my saying that ruined it. But I've never experienced that ever again. <laughs> <laughs> but it also, but also to tell me, it's like you probably should be praying the rosary or frequently because that that is something that is difficult for you to do. I've always said the rosary is one of the most difficult things for me to pray because it is easy to let your mind wander. But just because it's difficult, does that mean you should avoid it? No. It, you should, I mean, difficult. It's not difficult really in itself, but you know what I mean. But that's really what you should strive to do to, for that constancy, to just continue on. And that's what we're looking for. That, and then, and, and as, as you said before, Your Excellency, it's as God, you know, is looking for us to desire, to want to have sanctification, knowing that we may never, we, we won't actually achieve that perfection. It's, well, it comes to that point where people will quote scripture and they will say, uh, they won't, we can't be perfect. Only God is perfect. Our Lord said that. Why do you call me good? Only your father in heaven's good. But then our Lord also said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. But we're not going to achieve that absolute perfection. That's impossible. Not even the blessed Virgin Mary with all of her grace is to achieve absolute perfection. That's only reserved for God. But what we're told in that, in her example, the example of the saints, even our Lord's example, especially our Lord's example, to keep striving, to keep working towards it. And that's, that is the lesson in, in perfection. And that is where we get the strength, even in the aridity, in the dryness, to continue going. So we continue and continue with the theme to thirst for our salvation and the salvation of all those we are in contact with. Excellent. We're ready for the seventh one. The sixth one. The sixth one. We got two more. I've got the nod of approval from sister. (laughs) (laughs) The only thing I was just thinking about is that when it comes to consolations, we think those to be consoled involves like a big thing, a big emotion, but it, um, it's true. really the, it's really those little things. And that's really all that we should expect, really. Um, just like I believe miracles are happening all the time, uh, but we, we tend to compare them to the big sweeping miracles, you know, the, the absolute cures. Um, and we think because we're not experiencing something similar, we, we don't, we don't get miracles, but Sometimes I think it's a miracle I get get off the floor every morning. There you go. Um, (laughs) So, well, with that, the sixth word, Jesus, therefore, when he had taken the vinegar, said, it is consummated. It is is completed, it is finished, and we ask, what is finished? What is consummated? Um, His act of salvation. Um, Redemption. I should rephrase that because of what we said earlier there, that uh, we are redeemed by Christ without our effort, but we are not saved by Christ without our effort. So his act of redemption has been completed. Um, It has been completed in time, but not throughout time. I don't know if I can make myself clear here because our Lord continues this sacrifice in the sacrifice of the mass. Um, And so the bloody sacrifice is consummated. Um, the Old Testament has been fulfilled. There is no longer a bloody sacrifice. Um, we don't have the animal sacrifices anymore, but now we have the unbloody renewal of the sacrifice of Calvary. 
uh, where Christ is made present under the appearances of bread and wine and offered in sacrifice to his father. Um, and I think this is essential to our life here. And I think that's what I find really so offensive changes of Vatican II. Um, and I point out this is a new religion. It is a Protestant religion. Um, and though they still use Catholic terms like the Mass, they've reinterpreted the Mass to mean the Last Supper. And I've encouraged people, look at the scriptures, read the Gospels. Um, after they had eaten, um, well, even before uh, Christ rose from the table, he washed the feet of the disciples, um, instructed them. Uh, all of this has taken place. And then he takes bread and blesses it and says, this is my body and the cup he did in like manner. Um, so it, the Mass and the Last Supper are two separate entities. They are not one and the same thing. Uh, though our literature tends to confuse them, and I think the modernists have gone out of their way to confuse them, so that if you ask anyone today what is the Mass, they think it is the commemoration of the Last Supper. Um, and that is not it at all. Um, and so we have this continuation of Christ's sacrifice in our own time. Christ is made present in our lives here and now, offered to our Father in heaven um, on our behalf, right here and now in the world today. Um, and so Christ is kept alive, you might say, in the world. Uh, you know, it used to be we denoted time by before Christ uh, and in the year of our Lord, not after Christ, but in the year of our Lord. This is still the year of our Lord. Our Lord is still present. And he will continue. Um, so. I'm sorry, actually, just made me think that I had one kid I was doing catechism with. We we're talking about that. It's B.C. before Christ. And I said, I don't as well. And A.D. means Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. So that's what my teacher said. It says it means after death. Mm. After death. Yeah, after Jesus' death. Mm. I said... <laughs> No, that's that's not right. Well, that's what she says. Your teacher is, is wrong. Because <laughs> <laughs> that does not make any sense. Hmm. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't even want to think about it. It's about to make my head explode. <laughs> and that's how it was went on the video. <laughs> so, we would certainly get a lot of views, though. It's <laughs> <laughs> true. Our Lord's sacrifice is complete. Yes, yes. There is nothing to be added to it. There is nothing more to come. This sacrifice, though it is renewed on our altars, it is a complete sacrifice. It is a perfect sacrifice. Um, I recall shortly after I was ordained, was in an airplane talking to a Protestant, fundamentalist Protestant, and we're, you know, uh, nice conversation talking about all the problems in the world, um, you know, and the evils in society. And he asked, you know, what is holding back the hand of God? Why are we not already being punished? And after a short pause, I said, you're looking at the reason. Uh, because there are still priests in the world offering the true sacrifice of the mass. We are appeasing the wrath of God. And at every Mass, we're receiving the graces, the mercy of God, and that is what is holding back the hand of God. As soon as they wipe out the holy sacrifice of the Mass, that will be the end. There will be no longer any mercy. But as long as our Lord is lifted up on the cross in the sacrifice of the Mass, the mercy of God continues. Um, and I believe this is what the devils are promoting, the destruction of the sacrifice of the mass. And I, they're getting, in my opinion, very close to succeeding. Um, but God will, he has promised to be with us until the end of time. How is he with us? In the Holy Eucharist. Um, and not in a memorial, symbolic manner of the Last Supper, 
but really and truly present as he hung upon the cross. And this is the perfect sacrifice. Well, the I, I remember being explained that the the sacrifice of the mass, sacrifice of Calvary, one and the same sacrifice. And we can look at the sacrifice of the mass, the unbloody sacrifice, as as like the ladle that we and throughout all of time are able to dip into the infinite merits of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. It is our way of participating in that sac in the sacrifice. Uh, without actually being present in the historical event itself. And there, it is through the Mass itself that we take part in the merits of our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. And it continues, it continues to the end of time. And it shows us that there's no limit to God. And, and, and the, the simple argument, people say, how is that possible? So you think, God, do you believe God can do all things? Yes. Then why are you doubting this? Why are you doubting that, 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 that his sacrifice can continue through all time? He is outside of time. And, and the merits that we're receiving from that have to deal with eternity, not with just merely what we have on earth, but to help us get to heaven, to be with him for that eternity that that is that that's why it's a sh is a shame when you see the mass being reduced to a mere memorial i say mere because there there is the element of commemoration we are remembering the sacrifice uh, the historical event but we are also taking part in the sacrifice during the mass itself so it, it, it to say it's a mere just a commemoration, it's it's not just not doing it justice. It's a flat out lie. Well, we are called to participate in that sacrifice, and I think many Catholics forget that the offertory is where we bring our offering to this sacrifice. Uh, we bring our element to Christ's sacrifice, um, and you know we look at the offertory. Um, you see, we have to contribute our tithe, our 10% or whatever it is we can to contribute to the support of the church. Um, and we see this as a burden, as an mm -hmm. onus, uh, but actually this is how we unite with Christ's sacrifice. Uh, that money, that 10% that you put in represents a tenth of your life, a tenth of the hour of your week that you've just spent. Uh, one tenth of that past week you are now putting before Christ. This is a tenth of my life. Uh, this is for you. Um, I am bringing forth my tenth, uh, my part to join in this sacrifice. And with Christ, we unite our offering and the offering of Christ and our offering put together become complete not complete as if there was something lacking in Christ, but it becomes complete for us. Christ fills up what is lacking within us. And that is the other 90% that we've held back. Yeah. We're taking part into it. We're taking part in it. Yes. Which takes us back right to the beginning. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, in the in this chapter, there's to just... To the beginning. To the be Not from the beginning. Uh, there is oh. a section in here that stood out to me um, that it, it's highlighted um, or bold. Each of us has a task assigned. Just as our Lord came into the world with a task to do, so each one of us has a particular job to do in this world. We have our main purpose of life to fulfill, which is to know, love, and serve God. That is the general purpose of us all. No matter what our station in life or what our age, we are supposed to grow in the knowledge and love of God and come to serve him better. But God also gave us or God also has given us a particular job to do, one that concerns us as an individual as individual persons. He has in mind some special way for us to serve him, 
some special degree of love for us to arrive at while on this earth. There may be quite a number of small individual jobs for us to do, and when they are finished, then God calls us out of this life. Hmm. I mean, it does go on, it does go on to say, I'll read this next paragraph because I thought it was interesting as well. The biggest tragedy of life is to miss doing what God has sent us here to accomplish. The biggest mistake we can make in this life is to lay our plans with the question in mind, what can I get out of it? How can I get the most of life or most out of life for myself? Our question ought to be, how can I do, how can I best do whatever it is God sent me here to do. What shall I do so that when it is time to breathe my last breath, I can say as Christ said, it is consummated. Ask not what God can do for you, but what (laughs) you can do for God. Quite true, actually, if you think about it. Well, on the other hand, there's <laughs> nothing I can do for God. God doesn't need me. He doesn't need me. <laughs> oh, anything. but he wants go. me. <laughs> here, 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 here we go. Here we go. That, he that's... <laughs> yes, he, he, he wants my love. Um, he desires my love. Um, and that I can give. Um, and, and when you think about thing that he wants. When you think about that, Your Excellency, is that God is being perfect being complete within himself he doesn't need our love but yet he he wants it we're not going to complete god with our love but he still even as little as it is in comparison with his infinite greatness he still <laughs> well of course he descended down from heaven taking out our own our own nature Showing, show, uh, showing that he's willing to bend uh, down to us so we can be closer to him. It's just, there's, there's, there's no end. There, there's, there's nothing that we can use to measure the love that God has for us, that he must have for us. It brings me back to the thought of the little child collecting a bouquet of dandelions for his mother. Yes. Um, the dandelions are worthless. They mean nothing. They are insignificant. Um, but in the bigger picture, it is his love that those dandelions symbolize. And it may be, you know, materially nothing, but that love is great. You know, St. Augustine in his confessions looks upon his childhood and he says, I was a, a child so little, but a sinner so great. Um, and I think the opposite is true as well. We can be so little a child, but we can love so great. Um, you know, there there is no limits to how much we can love. You don't have to be grown. You don't have to be strong. Uh, you just have to have the love, and that is what God is looking for. Um, and as insignificant as it may be in the eyes of the world, it is precious in the eyes of God. Is, is it? Interesting when you think of that is all we need to do is give God God a dandelion. Mm-hmm. Well, I used to think as a young man, you see, I think it was Bishop Lewis mentioned many times in sermons that you see, if you give God a penny, he will give you back a million dollars as well. Here, Lord, take it all. <laughs> take everything I have. Uh, the vow of poverty sounds really enticing now. Here, Lord, take not only my money, but... Uh, Everything I have, everything that I am, I want to give it to you. Um, And, of course, we look at it from a materialistic, self-centered perspective. uh, But in the grand scheme of things, we're giving this life to gain eternal life. Uh, We're giving that which is going to pass away anyway, which we can't take with us. We can't keep. We can't hold on to it. But if we give it to God, he's going to give us eternal life. He's going to give us everything. He's going to give us himself. I give myself this miserable weed of a flower. I give this to God, and he's going to give me himself. I receive everything by giving my everything. Um, And I will receive those blessings 
to the extent that I give of myself. And God doesn't want half my love. He doesn't want 10% of my love. The commandment's very clear to love God with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole soul, our whole being, more than we love ourselves. In one, we have to love God. And I see this, especially in the religious life. Um, one thing I like to emphasize to novices is this gift of ourselves. And yes, of ourselves, we are nothing. We're miserable, we're weeds, we're defective, we're deformed, uh, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that I give myself completely to him. And at Christmas time, I ask people to look at the stable. Uh, that stable, when Christ entered that stable, it was turned into paradise. That stable was dirty, smelly, filled with dirty animals. Um, it was the most unsanitary, the most unappetizing place you can imagine. But when Christ entered that stable, it becomes beautiful. It becomes heaven here on earth. And the same is with our souls. No matter how defiled we are, if we allow Christ to come to us, our souls are transformed into temples of the Holy Ghost. God comes and dwells. We become heaven here on earth, uh, where we carry Christ with us. Are you crying, sister? Of course. <laughs> Are we ready for the seventh? You ready, Father? Okay. And Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, in saying this, he gave up the ghost. I don't know what we can add to that. <laughs> uh, it is. I, one thing I would comment is just think about the love that our Lord had for his Heavenly Father, for us, that for all the suffering he went through, all the physical, mental, and spiritual turmoil, that he endured, that he was able to shout in a loud voice before he died. And it, it was really the, the last uh, confession of the Son of God, his confidence and his love to his Heavenly Father, and for all of us, that to thee I, I, I commend my spirit, I return to you. Uh, this This is... I finished, as I said, I finished the work. And it reminds us that whatever work, whatever project we have in this life, especially the work of our salvation, we want to have that same confidence, that hope to say, I commend to you, O Lord, my spirit, that I've done what you have given me to do. I have been faithful in the task to knowing, loving, and serving you. So now I can say, Lord, I commend to you my spirit i come to you with confidence not not presumption because of myself i i do not trust but i have all confidence and trust in you in your word in your mercy in your grace and you have kept me from sin you have given me the grace to strive so i can say this with confidence oh my lord please prepare for me I am coming. You are calling me. I am ready. And if if we can approach our final hours, I, I've just given uh, someone last rites just two days ago. And we're reminded there that while the person is going through their sickness and while they're still lucid, just to keep remembering that, yes, God is your judge, but he is also your merciful father. He wants to see you in heaven. He wants you to overcome the temptations, the wiles of Satan, which are going to be attacking you with greater force now than at any other point in your life. And in, in that, you know, that mercy that is always there, has been there your entire life, will be there a hundredfold right now. 
if we take advantage of it, if we make use of it. And it's such a relief for the soul to know that, to remind it of that. As it says, oh Lord, we're you know, like, like a dove, where can I fly and be at rest? Now, I want to ascend to you like a dove. And a dove is a symbol of peace. So there's supposed to be peace in our hearts and our souls when we approach death. Not to be fearful of death, but to look at death longingly in, in the sense that it is through this gateway that I can now be with the, the desire of my heart. I can be with God, whom I've been striving for this whole time, my entire life. Death is only a fearful thing if we're in sin, if we're caught in the world. But death in itself is 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 the <laughs> I don't want to just sound redundant, but it, it is just it is that gateway to God for those that love him. And here our Lord enters with confidence and he gives us and he gives us the example to enter into eternity with confidence as long as we do what we're supposed to do in knowing, loving, and serving him in this life. We will have that, that peace entering into eternity. And that's why the sacrament as function is so beautiful that the church cares so much about, well, of course, our Lord, so much about his children that he provides even for that last struggle to remind us i am not abandoning you i want you with me in heaven i think of those words and i see really the completion of our lord's sacrifice um every heartbeat of our lord every drop of his blood he has given it all to god and now last of all as he is leaving this world, he's given his body, his breath. Uh, now I'm giving you my soul. I commend my soul to you, my spirit to you. I'm giving you that even. So I am not only have given you my thoughts, my desires, my actions, all the bodily things, physical things of this world I have offered to you. I have sacrificed here on the cross. But now, in addition to all this, I'm completing it. By commending my spirit to you, my soul I am putting in your hands. As I've put my entire life here on earth in your hands, now I put my soul in your hands. And he invites us to this. And I think it is really a consoling thing. And I do uh, appreciate what you mentioned there about extreme unction. And I find it really one of the consolations, if you will, of the priestly life. Um, St. Francis of Assisi, uh, in his letter to the uh, to the people, I think is the, the title of it, uh, he tells us not to sugarcoat someone's illness. If someone is dying, don't pretend that they're not going to die. Don't build them up with false hope. Uh, but really, the most charitable thing you can do is to tell them they're dying, help prepare them to die. And I've really taken that to heart. I hope most of my priestly life, but I can, after Bishop Lewis's passing, talking to Brother Pascal, um, I went out uh, during the week every night and would spend the night with Bishop Lewis when I could, the eight hours during the night to give the other brothers a relief. But one of the first things I always said to Bishop Lewis was, you are dying. Uh, would you like to go to confession? Um, do you have anything, you know, you need to prepare your soul to receive or to be received by Christ. You're going to be meeting Christ. Um, we need to look forward to this. And I know that the nurses would come and tell him, oh, we're going to reduce this or redo all these things. You're going to get better. We're going to get you up. And I would come and say, they're all lying to you, Your Excellency. You're an old man. You've had strokes. And there's no undoing these. It's too late to reverse any of this. You are dying. And after his death, talking to Brother Pascal, Brother Pascal informs me that after I would leave, Bishop Lewis would tell all the brothers that uh, I was uh, the Grim Reaper. 
that I came <laughs> preaching death and preparing him for death. Uh, but I saw that really as my duty. It was an act of charity. Um, it wasn't, in my mind, it wasn't something gloomy. And actually, I had a woman here in Rochester, uh, and when she was in the hospital, she would tell her children that she longs to die. She wants to die. She's tired of this world. And her daughter came to me, can you say something to her? Can you talk to her? So I went to her and I told her, Oh, that's a good thing that you're ready to leave this world. I said, but when you tell your children, don't tell your children you want to die. Tell your children you want to go see Jesus. You want to go and be with Jesus. And if you tell them that, it means the same thing, that you want to leave this world, uh, that you want to die. But it is much more palatable to them. Um, and, of course, even people in their illness and their pain are able to smile and say, okay, yes, I get it. Um, well, it's as I was with the family this last day, and, and the daughters are not Catholic, but when they're around their mother who wants the last rites, when they hear last rites, they think that of it as a negative thing, as a gloomy thing. Mom's mom's giving up. I, I, I heard this even a few months ago, went to give someone extra monction. It was very touch and go you know, problems with the heart and, and the age of the person who got taken into consideration and the distance we live from the people. Um, we don't have the parish priest uh, down the road anymore. So, so bringing extra monks or bringing Holy Viaticum and you have the daughters, or in this case, it was a, 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 um, a daughter-in-law, is, is all nervous. It's like, I don't want her to give up. I don't give up. I said, I said, this is not necessarily giving up. I mean, if she dies, she's going to die. We are being prepared for it, accepting God's will, whatever that may be. It Could it be God's will that she does recover from this? Yes, it could be, but we must be prepared. This is an act of God's mercy, and it is our duty as Catholics to be as ready for death as possible with that resignation. And then when you know, and especially those times in our life that we can practice that resignation. So when the time comes for us and it's going to come for all of us, um, well, I can't say it that way <laughs> because some of us might have an instantaneous death, but those of us who go through a longer uh, process, the sooner we can get to that resignation, accepting God's will, the more at peace we'll be. Not to be concerned about what's happening in the world. So don't tell me about what, what you know, that uh, my grandson just got the touchdown at the uh, football game. I don't, I don't care. I don't need to know what the first words of your grandbaby was. I, I don't need to know these things. It's not important. It's like, well, they don't care. No, it's I am focusing upon what is the most important, my soul, my salvation, God's will. And the family should not be put off by that. They should be encouraged. They should take it as an example of themselves to not be so consumed with the things of this world and to consume themselves with um, the, wor uh, the works of their, sal of their salvation. Um, and I remember in, in, in the words is that um, in the exhortation that's given to the person dying is to remind them to keep the holy names of Jesus and Mary ever on your lips, repeating them and daily acts and acts of contrition. And th this is, we, we shouldn't be put off. We should be inspired that I had to do that now. Now was the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. I, I might not get this what mom or dad are getting or grandpa and grandma's getting. I have to prepare myself now because I, may, I might not be prepared to say to Lord, it is consummated. He might say to me, guess what? It's consummated. It's finished. You're commending your spirit to me to be judged. <laughs> and, <you're, laughs> and it's up to us, work with the grace, to prepare ourselves so that we'll be entering into heaven for all eternities. I, I just I don't want people to be discouraged. I want to be an, encouraged by the sacrament of extra unction and to take it seriously, the work uh, working out their salvation. It's not a joke. We joke a lot. We 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 will chuckle a lot on this program. 
This is not a joke. This is serious. And if you're a Catholic, this is has to be the utmost, mo, the utmost, most, the most important thing in your life. This is now. I, now I'm ranting a bit, but this is why it's frustrating when you're trying to educate children and, and adults, for that matter. And they say, "Well, they got to get their other schoolwork done." I was like, "That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they don't go to college. It doesn't matter if they fail all their classes. If they lose their soul." And that's, that is most important. Of course, I got to be careful because people say, well, the fathers say schoolwork is not important. <laughs> but you got to put as much time, if not more, in the in knowing your faith and in practicing your faith. It's, uh, it's just one of those areas that can get frustrating. And you're just trying to encourage people and, and not, not to discourage them at the same time. <laughs> oh, I recall... A young priest uh, preparing a woman for death and giving her extra emunction and ca- counseling her and that her daughter was uh, sitting nearby. She could hear everything I was saying to her mother. Um, and I tried to put the woman's conscience at peace and, you know, to have her have that resignation that uh, when God calls, she will be ready to go. Um, as I was leaving, the daughter followed me to the door and said, you just gave my mother permission to die. And I said, well, if your mother needed my permission to die, I surely give it. <laughs> she's not going to die because I've given her permission. Uh, she's going to die because God has called her. Um, and, you know, if she is resigned and she's ready, what better time to go? Say, here I am, Lord. Take me when you will. I'm ready. Um, I'm eager to be with you. And I think really that is the attitude we need to have when we're dying. Uh, But I think also while we're living here on earth, um, we have to constantly have that attitude. I'm yours, Lord. Do with me what you will. Um, I'm happy if you give or if you take. It doesn't make any difference to me. I am content that I am pleased that you will do with me whatever you will. And you don't need my permission to love God. You don't need my permission to be eager for heaven. Uh, You don't need my permission to leave this world. Um, God will call you when he calls you. Um, And even if you decide, oh, I want to die, I want to die, God might keep you here for many years late, yet to suffer more or to love him more, to give a better example to your children. Uh, But whether God keeps me here or takes me now, I have to be ready and I have to be willing. Yes, Lord, thy will be done. That's an interesting statement to make to somebody as as though whatever you say would actually bring it about. Um, It's like, so if your mom dies, does that mean you're going to come and blame me for it? Well, that was what I took from it. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like you're going to blame me that your mom dies. It's your mom's yeah. going to. It's, it's, she, she is. She is uh, not going to live one second longer or one second less than what God wills. So, yeah. oh, but it, it's it's just having the the proper idea, the knowledge of what it means to prepare ourselves for God, for death. And it's, as you say, Your Excellency, it's something we have to work and strive for every day, live every day as though it's our last. And you know, not, not to ask ourselves, well, I knew I was going to die tomorrow. What would I do? Uh, I said, no, I, 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 so, so I had another thought pop through my mind and, uh, it was someone asked me a question when I was early in the seminary. And they said, what if, God, what if uh, an angel came to you and said that he will give you, that God will give you all the money you want, live in a great house, all the cars you want, a beautiful wife, all these things. All you have to do is leave your vocation and you're going to go to heaven. You are going to go to heaven. He says, what would you do? I said, would you accept it? I said, no. He says, 
He says, what? I says, no. He says, yeah, you would. I says, no, because that is a false angel of light. <laughs> God has made my vocation very clear when I heard from the mouth of my superior. I said, if, if then God is uh, talking to two sides of his mouth or both sides of his mouth, as they say, and God doesn't do that. He is truth itself. I said, so I said, don't even play with such thoughts because that will also lead you down the incorrect path if you think that's how God works. No, 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 no. Right, because we're, we're called to adore only God, and those examples is a is the example of adoring things. I mean, worldly thing. Yep. We all know that if you had all those things, you you would very quickly put God on the back burner and completely forget Him, and that just wouldn't make sense. It, so. Yes. Yeah. Of course. Yes. Well, I, I, I might have to say that the, this, this, we're coming drawing to a close of this uh, episode being consummated. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not merely a topic just for the Lenten season, but it is a topic that we should often come to the words of Christ on the cross, his example on the cross. The passion and death of Christ in general is the greatest and most beneficial topic of meditation for us. We should always want to revisit our Lord's passion because there are new things we can learn. And even if it's merely just conferring to ourselves our own insufficiencies and our lack of trust in him so we can gain greater trust, so we can develop a greater love for him then that is what it's all all about. That's why it's so important. The Lenten season magnifies it, but it's something you must carry all year long because as St. Paul said, you know, I died to myself, but now I live, with, I live in Christ. I know it's not the exact quote, Your Excellency. I think you probably know it better than I do. Uh, but in, uh, oh, how, see now how does, how, how, what's that quote, Your Excellency? It's uh, I die, but Christ, I live, but Christ lives within me. Yes. We'll let it go with that, Father. <laughs> yes, I think so. So, well, thank you, Your Excellency, for taking the time today, for being with us. You can thank Delta, or I guess we should <laughs> thank God who arranged Delta flights. So that- God, I, yes. And thank you, Sister, for, right. uh, well, th- th- thank you for, you know, mentioning it to His Excellency to come on. Just and, asked, and he could have said no. <laughs> he could have. He could have. We're glad you didn't, Your Excellency. So with that, we'll say Deo gracias. Deo, Deo gracias. gracias.